Hello. Well, if I may use an appropriately nautical phrase, tonight's programme sails off on a new tack, so far as Omnibus's coverage of the arts is concerned. It's about artists and theatre people, but at the local grassroots level, rather than the National Theatre, say, or the Tate Gallery, both of which we will be visiting, by the way, later in the season. The Bristol Showboat Saga, that's the name of our film, and it's a true-life story. It starts off like J.B. Priestley's The Good Companions, with happy theatrical folk. 1980s vintage, though, a little eccentric, perhaps, a touch bohemian, more than a touch Californian. Well, they band together to make a dream come true, a dream that centres on a rusty old coaster laid up in Sunderland, which they're going to convert into a kind of floating theatre and restaurant and moor it in the now-flourishing Bristol docks. Well, the cast of this drama on the high seas includes the poet and painter Vivian Stanchell, you may remember his name as the leader of the eccentric Bonzo Dog Doodah Band back in the 1960s, and there's his Californian wife, Pamela, though she and Vivian don't actually live together very much now. She's a writer. There's Peter Jackson, a plumbing and heating engineer, would you believe it? And Anne Slidell, an actress, and plenty more. With a handsome bank loan and a government guarantee, the project was launched, so to speak, back in 1982. And Tony Stavaker, the film's producer and interviewer, has been following the progress of the Bristol showboat on and off from then till now. And it's been anything but a calm sea and prosperous voyage. Early optimism has been tempered by the harsh realities of the business world. Houses and businesses have been put up for sale. Friendships have crumbled and alliances broken. But the boat is still afloat. Our story begins over two years ago on a beautiful stretch of the River Thames near Chelsea. It starts one day sitting on Peter's boat back down in Chertsey, and he had just had a crushing blow from his last lady friend, and Vivian and I were not getting along very well, so we just put together all the little dreams we ever had. And he always wanted a ship, he wants to be a captain. It's a boy's dream. And I wanted a coffee house. And uh, we thought, well, if you combine that and you stick it on a ship, what have you got? Well, she's a German-built ship, and she was originally built as a Baltic trader. She'd been laid up for five years, which meant that pretty well every last nut and bolt was rusted solid and seized. Um, there was a terrific amount of rust, sort of like cobwebs all over the thing, and a total air of neglect. So the first job was to sort of go around and clean everything up so that we could see exactly what we had here. And then we spent a lot of time, nearly a whole month, freeing all the valves off and um, generally making her work again and come to life. What a heap. I thought, oh my God. Until we went down into the hold and then it was a cathedral. And all the ideas are coming from that. I, I didn't design it and then try and fit it into the ship that's being designed around the things that I look at everywhere. I think it's wonderful. And of course it was real small to begin with because we were going to have to finance it with the sale of our own ships, our own houseboats. And um, it just grew and grew and grew like Topsy. And we're now sitting on this huge ship, which could barely get into the Bristol Harbor. But we'll make it. We're going to come in from the main part of the dock, go past Bathurst Wharf, turn round, and moor up on the Grove, uh, which is right next to the Harbor Police Station. This is quite a historic area, the old sailor's home, and various ancient pubs are uh, situated along there. The key side here is the Grove. Um, it's a very undistinguished part of the docks. The reason for the boat coming here is it fits in well and liven this part of the docks up, I think. This is going to be, I think, unique to any city. The fact that Bristol's got docks right in its centre and they're now coming alive. Um, a lot of recreation, a lot of entertainment going on. And this is just something totally different, which will add to what we've already got. Camera. I was only interested in the cabaret side. And I wanted to bring down people that um, are possibly obscure onto the boat and um, to exhibit them, if you wish. Curious poets, musicians, writers, talkers. When I was told that Vivian was Bonzo Dog Doodah band that took me back to college days, I'd heard of them, but I didn't like them, and I told him, and he said, well, I'll give you a record, and you might change your mind. 
This is the B side of our single, sports fans. Hope it makes you sick. I don't really mean that. Honestly, we're very nice chaps, really. In the canyons of your mind I will wander through your brain To the ventricles of your heart, my dear I'm in love with you again Cross the mountains of your chest I will stick a Union Jack To the forest of your cheek oh. To the holes in your string vest Oh, it was remarkable. I think that's really what I enjoyed most. The first time we met, um, Vivian came down and um, it was really... <laughs> I enjoyed meeting them and then I had to take them up to meet uh, a senior official in the council house and I thought, how on earth is this going to go down? And uh, he said, well, you ought to let the council know who you are. And uh, I, I didn't. You didn't let them know who you were? No, he did. Ah. What did he say? Well, he said um, he's uh, an artist of uh, distinction and uh, went on from there. It didn't strike home. I had to work very hard in trying to persuade the other officers that, yes, there was a good idea here. They hadn't been able to express it particularly well but they have got so much enthusiasm that it can't possibly fail. This is the lower deck where all the hoi polloi live. Engine room. This is my cabin, which I really like. It has its own sink and a couch and a bed and all kinds of things. And down here, it's the same thing without a sink. And I put Silky in here. And that's why her photograph's on the outside, so we can always find her. Silky is the product of Vivian and I. It's the best thing we ever made. And she has five planets in Leo. She's going to eat the world alive. This is the captain's level, with the exception of the kitchen, which is here. And I, my 19-year-old daughter, Sid, has come along, and she was going to stay in California and go to college, and uh, then she went to Paris, and somehow she's found inside herself a desire to cook. Peter is the captain. Because Peter's the captain, he gets the biggest quarters of it all, but that's all right, because these are the ones he's going to occupy permanently. And his bedroom, the only double bed on the board, which is why my cat has deserted me. He sleeps here all the time. The captain also has his own bathroom. Do you like to see his bathroom? But is it something, have you nurtured for some time, the dream of seeing yourself captain on the bridge? Um, not in those sort of terms. I've always wanted to um, have the kind of work, and the kind of freedom that I envy in other people who you see dashing around the seas. Um, I certainly want to go around the world, and I certainly want to see a lot of the world from a, a seaborne vista. And that's just sort of my preference rather than anything else. I've never been too sort of happy with package tours and things like that. Jeffrey is Peter's friend, and, and uh, Jeffrey was a farmer, and uh, one day when he was about 35, he decided to be a hippie. Then he went to California and found out that hippies are everywhere, and he kind of got discouraged, so he said, now he's working on the project. He works himself to the bone. It was wonderful. And Jackie, our lady engineer, was born to be a car mechanic and uh, fiddling with oil valves and things. I don't know what she does down there. The people that you find here on the ship are all from houseboats in a small area down in Jersey on a stretch of the Thames, and I've known them for five years. And they were just our local householding, you know, friends and neighbors. And, uh, and when we came away with this great idea, it pulled some of them away from their well-established homes, and they followed us up here. 
the way we've turned to sort of Pied Pipers, and we're leaving a lot of people behind that are, I suppose they could be considered, I mean, angry in a way. And they feel a mixture of things is what they feel. Yes, I think they're idiots. You can't have heating and plumbing experts and, um, what the hell. You must have an artist before you can have uh, a successful do. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. They can't do that without me. Vivian Stanchel is a national treasure, and he ought to be protected. He was born without any skin. There is nothing between him and all the sensations that the world has to give us. Because he has no protection, he is subject to anxiety attacks. Because he's subject to anxiety attacks, he takes things to avoid them, or he drinks. It keeps him from experiencing those things, but it also blunts and his genius, and it's killing him, of course. And I created this project to present him, cocoon him, house him, give him a stage. Maybe someday it still will. We were going to sell our homes, which consisted of our houseboats. And <laughs> that wasn't going along too well. Nobody was buying them. And um, aside from the fact that we didn't even put ours on the market, we won't talk about that. Anyway, we scraped together a few pennies, and I mean a few pennies, and we decided just for the hell of it, we'll go to Bristol and we'll open a bank account. And Peter went to the first bank. He felt, I mean, he had a feeling for it, which was William and Glenn's. And he presented the whole idea, and the guy said, yeah. Peter came out of it, <laughs> Peter came out of it going, he, it took him at least five minutes before he jumped up and down. He couldn't believe it. They said yes. And the government backs it. And um, I think that if the whole thing falls apart, which of course it won't, can't, um, the government pays for it. This is Anne Slidell. She met Peter at a party, and they got along real well, and he told her what he was going to do, and she got all excited and mortgaged her house the next day and gave us the money that we needed to give the bank as the upfront money to prove that we were solvent. She's an actress, and she's going to be taking the theater. I find it so exciting, I really do. The whole sort of situation, the ambience, everything about it. Um, that I'm going to be able to bring young people here. We're hoping to write our own material. I shall direct, and we will do all aspects of stage work, directing, writing, um, stage management, the lot. Which route are you going to take for the uh, journey to Bristol? Well, it's Peter's plan entirely. He's going the longest, most difficult way. He wants to be a captain for as long as he possibly <laughs> can in the most dangerous circumstances. And do you have um, full confidence in your captain? Absolutely, yes. I think the whole thing is absolutely amazing. Apart from my bad dream, when I I dreamt I was asleep dreaming, and Peter was in here. Did the you wheelhouse. Catch my that I gave you? Was this <laughs> the wheelhouse? This is the wheelhouse. This is the yeah. wheelhouse. <laughs> and Peter's yelling, Anne, where's my book? Where's my book? And I said, which book, Peter? My how to sail a, a, a ship book. And we were in the, in the ship in the middle of the sea at the time in my dream. And I wakened up floundering in the sheets. But no, I have every confidence. I think it's Can't tremendous. There is actually no more danger in going on the northerly route than going on the southerly route, especially for us, really. One, because she's a very strong ship. She's accustomed to taking bad weather. And two, there's not as much traffic around that way as the channel. <laughs> What sort of state was the boat in when it came arrived here? The bottom. Well, oh. what was it bad? Oh, it was terrible. Well, a lot of barnacles and mussel, you know, and uh, moss. Moss? Yeah. Quite a bit of moss on it. Yeah. Well, we worked till 8 o'clock last night, scraping it off. <laughs> Do you usually work on a boat when the people are still living in it? No. <laughs> no. You never see the nippers on the line all the way. What happened to the oh, bee that I'm going to eat? And down ladders. So there was some, there was somebody said there was a bean. No, to no, eat no. The that. potatoes are too hard, and the beans are stuck to the bottom of the pan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <not mine. laughs> Do you know? Actually, it's getting so bad the cook left, and we've actually got into the lifeboat rations now. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> pleased that this has happened because it's shown you guys yes. that Sydney really was valuable. That's we never right. ran out of things when Sid was here. It's inedible muck. Doesn't it's matter whether it's inedible. It was there, but there was plenty of it. 
our chef is a hairdresser. And uh, he said, don't you think it would be nice if you had a restaurant in the middle of all of that? So he's giving us, he's selling his hairdressing salon, which he's had for like 11 years. And uh, he's going to go be a chef. That's going to be interesting. Most cooks like food, and I'm afraid I like my food as much, much as most people. Um, I think one gets interested in food because of the taste of it, because you like eating it. We stand between, within minutes of having the project fall apart completely and losing the whole thing. Second. We're literally praying that Peter's mm -hmm. boat sells tonight mm -hmm. because then we can put funds in the bank, which means the bank will then consider releasing funds if our, our other participant, Richard, then sells his business on time. So it's one round after the other. But I'm They're still prepared to let them have the charge in my house. Ah, yes. I'm so. selling my house boat and I've had an offer on it and it's all subject to her getting a bank loan, some lady who wants to buy it and take it away, and definitely wants it. It's a good price and everything, and I'm just keeping but everything crossed. But he's lost the phone number of this woman. <laughs> the phone number. I've brought it up here with me. <laughs> uh, Peter, actually. Um, he and I were at a party one evening, quite independently. I knew about the boat, and at that stage, they were only interested in running a coffee shop and art gallery, and I, I said, well, you know, how about a restaurant? And we chatted, it must have been about three or four hours, drinking as well at the same time. By the end of the evening, I found myself running a restaurant. Of course, the usual thing, I woke up the following morning and thought, what the hell did I do last night? He started out as a chef, and now he's a restaurant manager. And no, he has not ever been a restaurant manager before, but what the heck, no one else he's has been very, anything before either. He's a very equable, pleasant person who will Solid, be very practical. good to have around. Right. You know? he's so useful. it doesn't matter if he can't cook, because he's not going to be the chef anyhow, but he gets on with people, he's an entrepreneur, he's smashing. I yes. thought he was your equable, solid fellow. <laughs> well, we've discovered <laughs> well, much to the contrary. you see, I turn out to be irascible, cantankerous, and very difficult to <laughs> and get when on with. he shaved his own moustache when, when I follow him, Don't he look at the moustache. <laughs> How are things? Ha, chaotic, to put it mildly. Um, after you came down here last time, Pamela and I, for the first time ever, actually started talking. And we found that there were a lot of things that were beginning to worry us, like the lack of urgency, like the lack of commitment, like the selfishness that had been happening. And we found, much to my delight, that um, we got on very well and complimented each other extremely well. Came back here to find that more money had been spent and no more work had been done. And Peter left us last Saturday at two o'clock in the morning. I returned to my cabin quite late that evening and uh, I'd been out for a celebratory pint with some of the crew and we'd been teasing the ship's cook, Sydney who had been quite querulous about a quarter-inch diameter piece of cheese that had been consumed by the lads, and myself in particular. And uh, apparently she'd shot downstairs. And, uh, I mean, this is so petty, it's, it's ridiculous. She'd shot downstairs and she'd complained bitterly to her mother <laughs> about the way she was treated. And uh, whilst I was locking the ship up for the night, I, I had got an imperial summons from a shut door. Uh, a high esoteric voice said, would you come in here, please? So I went in there, and they wanted to discuss, there was Anne and there was Sydney and Pamela, and they wanted to discuss my attitude to things. And I said, are you talking about the cheese? And um, they said, it, it is about that, but that's not, not it. So I said, well, look, I'm far too busy digesting the stuff to talk about it at this time of night. And this kind of um, lofty arrogance on my part, of course, is what incensed them. But it was my only weapon back at them for the kind of insidiousness that went on all the time. Um, I returned to my cabin and I started studying up various pilotage books and stuff like that for the morning, round the coast we were going. And about half one, two o'clock, the door opened and there was the delegation. And I was um, treated to a... Oh, 
a haranguing session is the only way you can describe it. And I was accused of all sorts of quite disgusting things morally and uh, financially. And I afraid I saw red. I lost my temper with them. Um, I shouted at them to get out of my room. I mean, this wasn't at all unusual. I'd been, I'd, I'd experienced this in the past a few times, the similar, the similar sort of things, but I'd really had enough. As it's pointed, I mean, this project, this isn't a ship with crew and a captain. This is, a, this is our project, and there is no captain here. And it became very evident that we were being relegated to the status of, oh, I don't know, deckhands. So he left us, and we're extraordinarily relieved. We feel free again, and the project's come back to life again. And we'll pull it together, my god. The following day, the Tuesday, I actually returned. I came back, as I say, with a, a, a quantity of money. I came back also with a set of proposals. There was no way that we were going to sort of resolve our differences overnight or anything like that. So I wanted uh, another director appointed to act as a kind of buffer. And I felt that Richard Price, who was going to be involved so heavily in the future, would be an ideal person. I spent ooh, the best part of an hour and a half attempting to try and uh, make them see that I did have a point of view. And um, I was literally just told to sort of leave, that uh, they would resist my, any attempt of, uh, on my part to stay on the ship. And uh, I can't ex describe the sort of the emotional feelings that I had then, because although it was our project, at that stage it was very much mine. I'd, um, I'd originated it, I'd found the ship, I'd found the finance. I'd found the people who were going to run it once I'd created it. And these people had sort of interfered and preempted everything that should have been good. And they'd taken away two years of work and they were just proposing to sort of toss me off as I was a piece of discarded toilet roll. And I was bitterly distressed about that. Who else have we got now that we haven't seen before? Well... Who's that fellow down there? Arthur. I didn't know what his name was. I, we began to notice that this man in orange overalls was always chipping our ship. So we went down and he said something to us and completely passed us by because it's in pure Geordie. And we finally deciphered it and it's simply that he was... He's 67, he's retired and he wants to be back on a ship. And so we've offered him... <laughs> we've offered him the job in Bristol of a caretaker, a jack of all trades. Uh, maintenance man. He's just delightful. And he's so strong. And what do you think of your, uh, of the officers? The, the, the ladies? Oh, well, I haven't gotten to know them properly, like, you know. But they'll be all right. I'm sure you've got a man around. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, they work hard, do they? That's Mark. And he spent a whole month here. He's never been out of the United States. He's going to UCLA. He's a drama student. And um, he spent one month in Sunderland. He's painted and shipped the entire mess with the entire conviction that someday this ship will be in Bristol and he'll be on our stage tap dancing his heart out, or whatever he does. Today he made us muffins. He's a muffin freak. Can, can the boy have a muffin? Can we? Oh. Ask Mark. It's Mark's maiden. Mark. Uh, let's see how many are left after we've had all we want, and then we can offer yeah. him one. <laughs> so hungry. Greedy. <laughs> so can you tell us about your dancing dress? Who made the dress, Sophie? Daddy? My daddy? My daddy's a long way ago. I think he's in a church. You think he's in a church? Yes. Why? Because he wants to see that church man. Obviously now everything's permanent me. Our decision is going to go. Richard is going to be, whatever happens, the sort of manager of the restaurant. But we haven't yet had any time to sort things out. I mean, he landed, yet, came here yesterday in a cab, and I said, um, hold that cab, Peter's left, do you want to go back? And he said, why should I accept the cab? Pack it. No, there's no doubt. We're going to get into Bristol, and we're going to get there pretty quickly now. And uh, the project will go ahead as it was intended. You're going to put some stake in it, aren't you? Yes, I'm, I'm putting in some, some money a little later on, uh, when we're in Bristol, which will go towards fitting out and uh, the interior work more now. 
Well, right at the beginning of this project, I took out a second mortgage. I took out a charge a few weeks ago, very much against Pamela's will, took it out quite willingly, which has gone. If we can't meet the quarterly repayments, I've lost my house, um, which is a problem. It's not worrying me over much at the moment because I'm quite convinced something will happen. We're sitting on a ship ready to go, and all we need is some... Well, they're usually men, aren't they? We need a man to captain it, and a man down in the engine room since Jeff is gone to get them up. But Jackie knows the engine inside and out now. She's great. She's terrific. And what could stop us? Nothing could stop us. to see them tomorrow, but I understand that they've left a little late and uh, it could be the end of the week. But um, we'll find out shortly, I hope. I loved it. Some of the things I saw were amazing. The scenery, Dover by lightning in the evening, was incredible. The refrigerator the fell over. Yeah. <laughs> we went out of the room, leaving poor little Silky in there by herself, and the refrigerator just slid right from the wall. The, the whole stove fell over, spewing our dinner all over Silky and everything else. It was absolute chaos. We were all standing around holding the refrigerator up for about half an hour while we roped it down. And we just got that fixed yes. and tried to start the engine again and the auxiliary generator went out. And every single light had gone off and Phil said it was a bit inconvenient to have no lights in the busy shipping <laughs> lane. And Very Jessie's, calmly. I said, oh look, there's something panicking. coming up behind us and Jessie just stood and waved her torch. <laughs> amazing. Oh, that was a journey. Amazing. Incredibly exciting. Amazing. Yes, it was incredible. And quite frightening at times. And very beautiful at times, and an unbelievable experience. It was very good. A few little problems, but nothing you couldn't expect after a ship laid up for seven years. So it was, it was a routine voyage, really, to us. Well, it wasn't that bad, like you know, but I think it's been bad for the women. Like. <laughs> for the bad. women? It's been bad for the women. And what next? We're going we to carry on work. Oh. We carry on work. And we have a day of rest on Sunday. Yes, we'll we work Richard's going to kick, kick us. Richard's going to cook us roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. and we're all going to have a lion on Sunday. We've been getting up at 4 and going to bed at 12. It's a, been a real testing period, because if we can work in this... If we, we can work, work, if we could have come round as friends. Yes, and we have. And we have. Haven't we? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no arguments at all. so delicate, I could wash paper with it. I could. Well, no, obviously, I, I don't get a lot of paper to wash. And a cleaning lady. <laughs> no, actually, uh, she left. It's my brother-in-law. He never stops wanting to, um, you know. His room is full of the most filthy magazines. Disgusting. Fine, thank you. You've still got to get a bit more pace, tempo. It's still a little bit more. You're still going, moving a little bit. Um, before I came down here, I was working in a restaurant. 
uh, sort of basic nine to five job, uh, which I hated. You know, I had everything, I had a flat and lots of money and everything was wonderful, but it, it, I just wasn't happy. I was just so frustrated. But like I said, I, I'm really not interested in politics. Of course, I'm assuming that because you tell me you're a pure bloody German, you love your country. Maybe I'm wrong. I do. And maybe you couldn't give a shit whether Germany is weak or strong. Maybe when you look at an old soldier like me, who's been through the Great War for the youngsters like you, and has come home defeated because the Jews and the Communists have sabotaged the war effort, maybe you have a good laugh, eh? Well, I got a, I got a letter from Anne a couple of months ago, um, sort of saying, we've got no money, everything's looking very bad, you know, and I thought, I was working at the Mill Marketing Board at the time, and I had a small amount of money saved up, and I thought, well, what the hell? I mean, it's not doing me any good sitting in the bank. Um, John, I first met when he was doing drama at college with my daughter. Then he left college and I, in fact, directed him in a couple of plays. He came down, did an audition and was super. And also sent me a letter with £500. He'd done four jobs mm. and saved his money up and sent £500 down for the pro project. Claire was also at college with John. She came down and auditioned. Again, mm very good audition mm. and within 10 minutes of her arriving she was over the side chipping mm. and painting the hull and she hasn't stopped since no. nothing else was open to me of course if i'd been a catholic it's all right the vicar's gone i'd have been an heiress i did an audition for um anne i was accepted which was very um, very good, but um, I'm not going to be appearing in the first couple of shows because I have no training whatsoever. Um, I was picked mostly for the fact that she felt that I had the potential, but um, as of yet I need a lot more training. Mark did an audition for me and p failed, which was very, very difficult because, you know, he'd come over from America and had planned on staying here, but I couldn't accept him. He was competent but we've got to be more than competent. So Mark failed, and he's returned to the States. Richard phoned up on the evening that we got our license and said, yippee, great. Then he said, do you want to hear the bad news? His business that he'd been trying to sell had fallen through. And he said, go ahead without me. So at the moment, Richard appears to be receding. What we have is absolutely everything you could name. We have goodwill, we have all the workers lined up, we have support in Every field you can imagine, what we don't have is a penny. Mm -hmm. Not one penny. It's marvelous. <laughs> it's a bit stress provoking. This is the drama workshop, opening this on Thursday um, with BOP, the Bristol One Parent Project. They're coming along because they want to do some drama, so they're, they're meeting here. This will be our opening christening session of this it's basically my area for me to say what's going to be done in here and it's super it's lovely well doctor we have examined the patient with every care and there is no doubt that she is chock full of impurities my daughter impure uh, i ought to have said that there are many impurities in her system many karate tumors <laughs> i understand uh, we uh, propose to hold a consultation quick a chair for the doctor uh, when you try to butt in and, and stop um, um, Catherine's imposition, if you could sort of, again, lean in. I'd like to get the impression that you're both leaning over him. For some time now, since the Arts Centre in King Square closed, there's been a terrific shortage of a, a venue in central Bristol, and we were looking for a venue in which to present lunchtime plays. And we could see at a glance that this was going to be an ideal theatre space. Um, so we, we immediately just sort of leapt at it and slotted it into our plans. We've been able to get a small team down to help to, to panel the, the hold and do the wiring uh, and we're going to install the lighting equipment. It's an ideal space and the way they've built up the superstructure here gives you a proper headroom. It's very, very good. Ah. Well, I'm the side foreman, which is extremely funny because I don't know anything about sewage or electricity or generators and I'm having to learn it on the spot. It's much worse than the begging for money, which we never got. Uh, the money came only from our brewers. Marston's not only said yes, we had a contract in a week, 
and the money came in very shortly after that. Everybody else told us how wonderful it was. Isn't it marvelous? Oh, boy, they hope we succeed. So does everybody else. But they put their money where their mouth was. Thank God. We've actually loaned them um, a small amount of money to help them tie themselves over, and we've also contributed um, an amount of money. It might have been a lifeline, but it would have got there eventually because of the enthusiasm. Had it not been us, maybe it had been somebody else. Somebody else would have uh, been accosted, maybe. <laughs> when I first met these ladies, who were introduced to me by uh, a well-known bank, I wondered what was, what was going to hit me. Uh, and it's been a lasting impression that what did hit me was two people of extraordinary personality. Strong, very striking, and I think this is, let's face it, their greatest asset. It's wonderful and loud, and he tells us to shut up. And it's a good thing to tell us to shut up occasionally, because we both talk at the same time, which we're doing very well at not doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're learning. We've become a real good double act. Um, and he's a lawyer, and we need a lawyer. Notice is hereby given that the first annual general meeting of the above-named company, Creative Culture, will be held on Thursday, the 26th day of April, 1984. Uh, the next thing is you will say that the accounts are being prepared to the end of March, but are not yet ready. OK? So you're going to adjourn this meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. I'm terribly sorry. Go oh. on. I've never heard a word. All right, you're going you're to have to leave it to me, aren't you? Okay, I'm, I'm, right. I'm supposed you're to adjourn going to say, the meeting. I heard adjourn the meeting. And all right, I knew now you better leave it to me when me. it comes to it. Oh, he's getting angry. I'll ask. Will you dig me in the ribs? He is getting angry, you're actually. On. I can tell you it's a sort of a hot flash. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. Okay. Yes. There's no telephone number at the top, so he still hasn't connected his phone. Dear Brian, please accept this as my proxy for you to attend the general meeting of Creative Culture Limited in Bristol on the 26th inst. Regards, Peter Jackson. It's his best He's friend. got two best friends, and this is one of them. And he works in an office directly across the street from us, and he keeps tabs on uh, what we're doing, I, and he reports back to I've Peter. I've just been explaining uh, that uh, as, as a member, of, is not a member of the company, Mr. King. Mr. King, therefore, can't technically take part in the meeting as the form of proxy which has been delivered has only been received today under the Companies Act. It's got to be here 48 hours before. Uh, an accountant is currently working on the preparation of the accounts, and I understand that he hopes to have them ready in about three months. So uh, a resolution will be passed that this general meeting be adjourned until the accounts can be circulated to all members, and then the meeting will reconvene. Now, is, is there anything that we can usefully discuss while you're here? Um, not really. I, I've really come here to take any messages back to Peter, who can't be here today. So there are no messages from Jackson. <laughs> no, <laughs> no messages from and no messages tapping. to. <laughs> I'm just literally going to give him this, um, these minutes. Hmm. And tell him what happened, which is nothing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Good. All right? Yes. Fine. Okay, well, thank you. Come here. <clears throat> thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. All right. Can you find the way pieces of paper? Yes, I can. So, Anne, what's, what's now the legal situation vis-a-vis -vis your third partner? Well, I have been granted legal aid, unlimited legal aid, I believe. Yes. Um, to, and I believe from Brian Simons that a writ has been served on Peter Jackson. Um, um, referring to the overdraft facility that was granted to Creative Culture, um, a personal loan to Pamela, Peter Jackson and myself. Anne Slidell has discharged the whole loan from her own resources, substantially by, by selling her house. Uh, she has put all her money into it and she now wants Peter Jackson to pay his share. It may lead on to other things later on. But uh, that is the, uh, the nub of the action at the moment. We've done everything we can do. If they come, they come. If they don't, they don't. I think our only problem now is living up to the promise. Um, we'll open. People will come. What we now have to do is really do what we said we were going to do. I don't see how we couldn't. I mean, if we could do all the other things we've done, damn it, we'll be all right.
the last minute, I'm just going to invite everybody I ever knew to come and perform, and maybe somebody will, or we'll have somebody with a guitar. What the hell? People can get pissed, they won't notice. Fantastic. Anne and Pamela have brought the whole thing to a, the beginning of the conclusion, which, remembering back to oh, six, seven, eight months ago, uh, it's just a knockout. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded. I had to drop out. My business didn't sell in time. Uh, we have a very good friendship going, anyway, and I'm very glad to be here tonight. The time, 1176. The place, the battlements of Elsinore Castle. Two guards, atmosphere. Woo, woo, woo. Not a mad story. You come most carefully upon your hour. What has this thing appeared again tonight? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. No, my cousin Hamlet and my son. Oh God, a ghost. Daddy! Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder. <laughs> the time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite. <laughs> that ever I was born to set it right. How does the Lord Hamlet? I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. For you yourself, sir, should be as old as I. If like a crab, you could go backwards. Though this be madness, yet there is better in it. The fair Ophelia, nymph. <laughs> in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Oh, oh, my lord. Get thee to a nunnery, to a nunnery, go and quickly too. Oh, but tis so brief, my lord. As woman's love. I think they've worked particularly hard on trying to put together uh, events, entertainments, and activities which will appeal to people and they're testing the market all the time with different types of activity. Um, perhaps their advertising isn't as strong as it could be. I don't think sufficient people know in fact that they're even here. But they are still trying very hard and with some success, yes. Yeah, well we're supposed to be working on a um, sort of a publicity campaign, sort of a package so that it's a bit more um, well, people know it's happening because we have a tendency of finding, you know, people say, oh, yes, I've heard of that place. What is it? Or, you know, things like that. They're beginning to know where it is. <laughs> beginning to get that through their heads. But uh, what it is is another thing, you know. Um, unfortunately, I've been away for the last week, so I haven't done that much work on it. But, uh, yeah, we do want to get something together to sort of suggest, explain. 
I had heard many things about what had been going down there. Friends of mine had been going into the ship and keeping a regular eye on it. Vivian himself has paid several visits there and um, he tells me a few things. And so I knew that things had been a lot tougher than the sort of Dick Whittington tale that had been painted in the beginning. They, uh, the phone rang and when I answered I was extremely surprised to find Pamela in gushing mood on the other end of the line. I'd been beset by a terrible cold and so I was hardly even able to croak back. And so I sat there and I listened to a, um, a tirade against Anne and oh God, Peter, I wish we weren't at the end of a line and you know, I could talk this over with you personally type stuff coming out of Pamela. Um, and then, uh, not exactly blackmail, but a little point was made that, you know, Anne's suing you in the court and is going to take you to the cleaners and all this sort of business. And I will not testify if, if you will um, vote with me to get rid of Anne. So I told Pamela that I just was not interested in that kind of deal. So I haven't heard anything more. What did that say? Oh. Why does it say Arthur's menu? Because Arthur's the only remaining member of the crew who can cook, or who will cook. And he's very happy. He's really happy. And the restaurant has, has finally stopped taking a nosedive. And we're not making any money, but we're not losing any money anymore. David, uh, looking back over the kind of 10, 11 weeks since it's open, how do you think it's gone? I think the project has started off incredibly well, but obviously the problems which have occurred have been personal ones rather than to do with the project itself. It's very sad because this project had, as we said right at the very beginning, an enormous amount of potential. It's in the right place, it's at the right time. But unfortunately, it's run by people, and that's something which you can't get away from. Uh, two ladies of strong will whose visions were not eye to eye the same. Regrettably, because of the financial problems primarily, those tensions have grown over the past months until now we have the position that they frankly no longer are able to believe in each other's viewpoint. It does mean, so far as I can see, that one of them would now have to fall out of the management of the project for the foreseeable future. And I believe that they are both finding this exceptionally difficult to do because they have poured their lives and souls into it. And to give up this is almost akin to perhaps to giving up a child. It's like a nest of vipers. They're waiting for me to go away but they don't understand that I'm not going anywhere. Anne is threatening to liquidate the project, and they believe that she can do that, and that they then will pick up all the pieces and run with all the marbles. Well, she can't. It's money, isn't it? I mean, the only people, everybody out there is going to do what's the best for their pocket, you know? And the best for their pocket is not to liquidate this project. And the best that we can do is to, is to go forward with it, make it better, have new ideas change and be, and be malleable and to be flexible. And if there's one thing I am, it's flexible. Next year is Bristol's 150-something or another. I don't even know what the heck it is, but I do know that they're, they're making connections with the states and they want all sorts of marketing and all sorts of publicity. So I am now going to all sorts of companies and I'm putting together a package and I'm selling the ship, as I say, with me involved. Anne will get her money back and she can go do whatever it is that she wants to do. And the bank gets their money back and they'll be damned happy to see it and to see the back of us. And we're going to New York. The whole ship is going to New York as a Bristol emissary and I'm taking Bristol products, a Bristol show, a Bristol brewery, and me and my people and I'm getting this all organized legally and it's all going to be documented so we won't have this pickle anymore so everybody knows who everybody is and what everybody's doing and I'm not worried about all this because this whole thing is me anyway and I still remain with me and I can still come up with ideas and the ship is sitting here, we did it, didn't we?
was thinking was, if I was a viewer of this program, uh, you watch, you watch people coming and going and people being thrown out and people running away screaming and in the end you see me sitting here and you think, God, she eats people alive. But I don't, I haven't done anything. I've just watched it happen and keep going, well, well, let's do this or let's not do that or let's go in this direction or let's not or, you know, leave me alone. But it could look like that, but that makes me the most brilliant Machiavellian character that has ever, ever lived because I don't have any money, I've never had any money, and I'm still here. Please believe me.